Hi everybody, welcome back to Bentley House. Today I am so excited to be doing a book nook for the very first time. And it's also a collab with Miss Many Life. We've been talking about doing this for a while and I was so excited she was willing to allow me to join in on her fairy tale series. She's been doing a post-apocalyptic fairy tale series for a while and I have been enjoying every episode. So this is kind of a play on that idea. We each chose a different fairy tale and we made a hallway that's transitioning from real life into the fairy tale. We allowed each other to kind of come up with our own idea or our own interpretation of that idea. I've decided to turn mine into a book nook because I think it's a really cool like to idea to like transition from like the real world towards the front of the bookcase to a door in the back in a bookcase to a book. You know. Did I say what I chose? I'm doing Alice in Wonderland, which is more of a modern day fairy tale. It's one of my favorites and I recently finished playing Alice Madness Returns and the entire time I was playing that game I was thinking I have to make an Alice miniature, I have to make an Alice miniature. Now this won't be directly based off of the game, it is more generalized Alice, but of course I will add a nod here and there, hopefully. So do make sure after you're done with my video to go over and check out Miss Mini Life's video. I will be putting a link in the description box below. So without further ado, let's get started. I'm again reaching for cardboard for the structure of this room. It's something that's just always around, it's easy to cut, it's easy to manipulate, and it's quickly becoming one of my favorite building materials. I had sketched out a general idea on Procreate, trying to throw in as many references as I could think of, and some of them make it in, some of them don't, but I knew I wanted to do some perspective. So at the front of the hallway, I'm starting in 12 scale, and at the very end of the hallway, it's going down to half scale. And this is very appropriate for Alice in Wonderland, because Alice herself goes through many size changes throughout the story. I'm using hot glue to start tacking the walls together. This makes the building process go really quickly. But when I add my interior finishes and all of the wall paper and all of that glue, that's what's really going to hold the room box together. So the hot glue is really just to start putting things together. I'm going to be leaving a big chunk of the ceiling off because I can already tell this is going to be a pain to work with because it is such a thin space and especially a pain to film inside of. And so it's always a battle between making sure that I can see and also making sure that the camera can see. I am adding one thin piece of the ceiling because I do want the wallpaper to slightly go up. I want the whole hallway to look like it's warping and it's changing as it's going further back into the book nook. I also wanted to make sure and make the back wall, which is going to have the door that enters into Wonderland. And before I glue that in, I want to go ahead and make the door on that piece of cardboard because that is going to be one of the most difficult walls to work on once it's in place. I'm going to keep the door process very simple. I'm just using these coffee stirrer sticks, cutting them down to size, and then gluing them within the keyhole shape that I've drawn on the cardboard. This door is supposed to be inset into the stone wall at the very end of the hallway. So I've decided to use egg carton to create the stones and it makes sense that I would create the frame for the door out of the same material. I should have found some way to like trace the door but I didn't so I'm just kind of estimating how the frame needs to look and slowly checking it as I go along and then cutting out the frame at the very end hopefully making it correct. And then from my cutout pieces, I can start to create the individual stones that I'm going to glue on the cardboard, and this is what's going to make up my stone wall. But before I glue those on, I'm gonna go ahead and cover my wood sticks with a layer of black Mod Podge. And once that's dry, I'm going to glue on my door frame, and then I can go ahead and glue that entire panel into the back of my book nook. The reason I'm gluing this in now is because I want my stones to be both on the back wall and on some of the walls and the ceiling that are coming off of that wall. And for that to look right, I needed to go ahead and glue in that panel. I also made a few interesting shaped stones like the heart shaped stone you see right above the door, kind of as a reference to the Queen of Hearts. And this is what I mean by the stones moving from the back wall to the side wall. 
I found this card that I had in my collection. It's from a card deck I had used in previous art, so it's no longer a complete deck. And I am so glad I still had the Queen of Hearts card and I was able to glue that on. I want it kind of peeking out from the sides, kind of in between the transition from the real world to the fairy tale. Once I had all the egg cartons in place, I'm going to use a mixture of drywall compound and Elmer's glue. It's a 50-50 mixture and this is going to go all over the top of the stones and I'm going to be really careful not to get any on the door. Once it's completely covered, I'm going to let that dry and then I'm going to go back and do a dry brushing of brown on the door. And I didn't... I don't know why I didn't do this before. It would have made sense to do it earlier, but now I'm also going to be painting the stones gray and working really kind of slow and making sure that I'm as careful as possible to keep the wood and the stone separate. I also tried to incorporate the card and have some of those stone textures and paint kind of engulf it a little bit. I made a pattern for the floor and this is going to be a partial pattern for the floor because part of it is going to be a chessboard and part of it is going to be some wood flooring that would be in a normal hallway. I'm using mat board like I usually do for tile floors. The reason I like this is because I can score the top of the mat board and easily remove a small strip of the very top layer of paper. This looks like a grout line between my tiles. This is going to be a chessboard as chessboards are often seen in the Alice in Wonderland series and I'm going to have a few of the tiles starting to break off where the transition is going to happen. I feel like I already have a lot of practice making a warped checkerboard floor from Beetlejuice. So this was kind of a flashback. This, was, this floor was so much easier than Beetlejuice's floor. I'll just tell you that right now. In order to keep the floor from warping, I'm going to be painting the front and the back at the same time. I am still going to be painting with white paint, even though the mat board is white. That just helps protect the paper down the line. Once I have each shape, painted, I'm going to go back with green and fill in the grout lines with a green base coat. Later on, I want to put some moss or some grass growing up in between the tiles, and so painting it green is going to give me the ability to just kind of loosely put it on and not worry if I'm missing any spots. So anywhere you see green on the floor, that will eventually be covered with moss. I'm slowly adding the floor and then gluing on the broken tiles and I'm laying my one, two, three blocks on top to make sure everything stays flat. The other half of the floor is going to be the wood flooring from the real world side of the hallway. I'm going to be doing pretty much the same technique, but instead of doing a checkerboard floor pattern, I'm going to be doing straight lines so it looks like gaps in between my floorboards. I'm also making the ends of the floorboards look a little bit more jagged so that I can continue to add my moss that works in the transition between the wood floor to the checkerboard floor. I'm going to have some of that moss also continue into the gaps between the floorboards and I just think that's going to kind of bring everything together. Once that piece is dry, I can go ahead and glue it in place and make sure that everything lays flat. Hopefully and now I can be done saying floorboards that was starting to become a tongue twister. Moving on to the wallpaper, I chose this wallpaper because I felt like it was one that looked like more of a stately home during that time. I liked the stripes and it had little flowers on it with some black and white polka dots and I felt like it could really blend into the Alice aesthetic. I went ahead and backed it with some poster board. I like to back my paper with poster board when I'm gluing it to cardboard. Cardboard likes to dimple whenever you put a thin paper on it. So I like to make sure to strengthen it a little bit with poster board. I went ahead and cut it into strips. This is going to make it easier to apply and it's also going to make it look a little bit more realistic because that's how real life wallpaper is applied. I decided to rip into it just a little bit to make sure that the Queen of Hearts card was showing through and then anywhere else I felt like the wallpaper would have been ripped away to start exposing the stone from the transition from the real world into the fairy tale. Now here I have a little rook that is the basic shape that you print whenever you get a new resin 3D printer. It's just kind of a standard that everyone prints, which I will be talking about that a little bit more towards the end of the video but it was perfect for this project. 
as you saw in my original sketch, I wanted chess pieces kind of near the walls. It isn't quite solid. It has like these openings. So I'm using some glue and water and some tissue paper, well, some toilet paper to paper mache the sides. So I then get a solid rook figure that I can inset into the wall. This is just a mixture of glue and water. This is going to help me get it smooth to the outside surface. Once it's dry, I'm putting it into the project and kind of tracing an outline of it on the wall. I can cut that out with my X-Acto blade, but to know where to cut, because it's going to be easier to cut on the outside, I'm poking holes at the corners of each shape I need to cut. Then I can cut from an easier angle or an easier way to access the cut from the outside, and it's basically just connect the dots to get the shapes I need. Once that's done, I can put the rook into the hole I just cut to make sure that everything fits. My plan is to make it look like it is part of the wall or possibly even growing out of the wall and trying to maybe even just get onto the chessboard. It was at this point that I took a picture of what I already had and decided to do another mock-up on what I wanted to create within this space. I knew I wanted to make a reference to the Cheshire Cat and I figured the ceiling would be the perfect way to do that. So I cut into the ceiling, I made more stones and I started to go around the hole that I cut and add more stones around the rook to make it really look like the stone wall was encasing it. You may have also noticed in my drawing I made these really bright blue mushroom lights and so those are going to be my next task to even figure out if they were possible. To attempt to make these, I'm using some fairy lights, some scrap polymer clay, and some mold putty, and these are all going to come together, hopefully with hot glue, to make some really interesting mushrooms. I made two different size mushroom caps, and then I'm making three different mushroom stems that hopefully I can make a mold of. The one on the very top left, or the one in the center now, ends up not being a great one that will work, or actually it just doesn't work. So it's going to be the two shapes on the side that end up working. I bake them according to the package instructions and now I'm going to make a mold of each one of these pieces. This amazing mold putty is really great because it's super resistant to heat temperatures. You can put it in the oven when you're baking clay, but also I know it will resist the temperatures of the hot glue gun, which is what I'm going to be trying to use. I'm wrapping the mold putty around each one of the stems, making sure that I can still see both ends sticking out. They kind of look like little pigs in a blanket once they're done. Then I'm allowing it to dry or cure, and once that's done, I have two mushroom cap molds and I have three stem molds. But one of them doesn't end up working out, so I end up just having two. They were a little difficult to get out of the molds. I think this is the one that ends up not working just because it's just way too, it's too curved to where it's just difficult to get out of the mold, which means it'll be difficult to get my, my pieces that I create with the hot glue out of the mold. I decided to go ahead and mark on the mold the shape of the stems so I knew which one I would be casting when I used it. I'm just using a ballpoint pen to do this. I'm not sure why I don't have this part on video, but to use the stem mold, all I do is take the hot glue gun, put it on one end of it, pump glue until I see it starting to come out of the other end, and then I stop and let the glue dry. To use the mushroom cap, I take one of the stems, hold it upside down in the hot glue while it's in the mushroom cap mold, and then once I take it out, I have a complete mushroom because the stem hardens with inside the mushroom cap mold. Now, the trick to this is to get a light inside of it and still have it work this well. So to test this out, I went ahead and got a piece of scrap wire. I didn't want to use one of my actual lights in case I messed it up or in case it didn't work at all. I filled the stem mold full of hot glue and then pushed the wire, which I had pre-bent into the shape that I wanted it to be. I pushed it until I almost saw the wire coming out of the end of the mold, and then I let that dry in place. Once that was done, I could pull the wire and the stem out of the mold and then put it upside down into the mushroom cap mold and then it was complete and the end of the wire was in the mushroom cap which is perfect because that's the part I want to be glowing when I actually use a light.
In my drawing I had these as bright blue mushrooms so I wanted to see if glass paint would work and it did and then I covered it with Mod Podge and so it was extra protected and I tried to scratch it off and it was super, it worked really really well. So I'll have to keep that in mind. Even though I don't end up painting my mushrooms in the end, I just leave them plain hot glue because they ended up looking really cool. But I wanted to know if that was possible anyway. With the mushroom experiments done, it was now time to actually try it out inside the room box or the book nook. To install the lights, I started by punching holes into the walls where I wanted the lights to be. These are going to be where lights are going in and out of the wall or where they're coming through to be inside of a mushroom light. I'm using a sharp needle to punch through the wall to make sure I like where the location is on the inside and then I'm using something a little bit larger to make the holes larger so that the lights will actually fit through. I also made sure to circle wherever the pin came through so that I didn't accidentally miss any holes with stringing my lights. I left four or five of the lights at the very front of the room because I want to have some extra light up there. And then I started punching them through the holes where the mushrooms are going to come through the wall. I basically folded the wire in half so that the little LED light was at the very end and then pushed it through and then taped it so that it would stay in place. This is going to end up looking kind of weird when you're done because all I had was just basically wires sticking through and lights all over just in a weird pattern in the middle of the hallway. But eventually these will all be inside of a mushroom light. I also have three at the back which is going to light up my Cheshire Shire, Cheshire, Shire, my Chesh, Cheshire cat smile. There we go. Apparently there's a lot of tongue twisters in today's video. Because of the way these lights are, I'm going to have to create the mushrooms while I'm working inside of the book nook. This makes it very dangerous because if I spill anything, it will ruin the finishes I've already created. So I first started by pushing the light wire through the stem mold and making sure that the light came all the way out the other end. And then when that had cured, I put a bunch of glue into the mushroom cap mold and then pushed the end of the stem into the mold. And when that cured, I had a completed mushroom with a light in the end of it. And honestly, this process was working really, really great. I got all the mushroom lights done, and then I got to the final light on this string and disaster struck. I accidentally clipped through one of the wires. These wires are so thin, which is maybe not one of the greatest reasons to use these kinds of lights, but they are cheap and easy to use. Um, but it basically made all of my lights, my previous lights, go out. And the only way to fix this was to clip off all the mushrooms, remove the string of lights, and start over with a brand new string of fairy lights. Seven came in a pack, so I knew I had six more chances to get this right. But it was a really frustrating moment feeling that I had just wasted an entire string of lights. I had wasted several hours of trying to get these mushrooms to look right and they had cured over time. And I was just ready to move on. But I will tell you I was able to save quite a bit of masking tape and um, I was able to reuse those. <laughs> but everything else went into the garbage which was very, very sad. So I've got to admit, I was pretty frustrated at that point. I decided to just put everything down and I went to bed. I decided to just start over the next day. And I thought this would be a good place to kind of insert some advice. If you find yourself in a situation like I was where you're just completely frustrated and you're having to tear out a bunch of stuff that took a lot of work, make sure you walk away and get out of that anger feeling before you start the project again. Now you can continue feeling frustrated because I did even the next morning when I knew I had to start over. But if you're working in anger, a lot of times our hand movements are faster and we don't quite have the calm we need to fix the problem. So make sure you give yourself a break, take a nap, watch a movie, do something exciting to take your mind off of the initial anger that comes with messing something up. And then you can come back refreshed and renewed and try again. And then you will have a much better chance of fixing the problem instead of messing it up more. All right, so back to the project. 
The next morning I was able to sit down and really concentrate and get the mushrooms finished, which I was very excited about. I felt like I made up for all that progress I had initially lost and it was time to officially attach them to the room. So I pulled through the stems, just the very end of the stems, and then added more hot glue and covered them up with masking tape to make sure that my wires weren't accidentally pulled. I went around and did this at each location where I had a mushroom coming through the hall. This also allowed me to position them so they looked more natural like mushrooms that would grow out and up out of a stone wall. And this is how it is looking so far. Moving on to the vine that I had drawn in both of my renditions of this room, I knew I wanted to add one. It kind of adds to the excitement of this hallway turning into an entire new world. And so I grabbed some greenery I had in my collection and just started gluing it in place, making sure that it worked with the corner. I wanted it to cover up the door just a little bit. I think that adds a little mystery to any door. I also added some to the top and the side of the rook to make it look maybe like a little planter type of a situation. In my original drawing, I added cards growing off the vine, and I remembered that I had cards from a previous project that I had never used. Luckily, those were just printed out on a sheet, so I cut them apart, and one side has just red watercolor paint, so they do look like cards from both sides. Those were easy enough to glue onto the vine itself, and it really does look like some of the leaves are turning into cards, or there's actually cards growing off of the plant. And since I was already on the track of adding more greenery with the vine, I figured it was time to work on the moss. So I just added little bits of glue on the areas that I had previously painted green, and then I used some tweezers to pick up tiny bits of moss to gently drop into the glue. This is a Woodland Scenics brand. It's kind of expensive, but honestly, I've had this jug for maybe five years, so in miniatures, it can last quite a while. Some of the moss overlapped the tiles, but I was okay with that. I think it gave it a much more natural look. Once that was done, I decided I wanted to age my stone wall a little bit more. It was looking just a little bit too much like just one gray color. So I added some chalk pastel above the door frame and in the corners to really give it some life. Now, of course, you all know we can't have a keyhole shaped door without a doorknob with a keyhole. So to create this, I cut a rectangular sheet of paper, I glued a bead to it, and then I took a tiny bit of joint compound, put that into the hole of the bead so that it looks like one solid doorknob. I painted it silver, and once that was dry, I used a dotting tool to put a tiny dot of black paint. I used the other end to kind of pull the paint down, and that made a perfect keyhole on my doorknob. It's so funny to me how much I ended up loving the doorknob here because I often forget to add doorknobs to my projects. They're like my last minute thought. There's the door there and I just don't think about adding any kind of handle. And so um, I really liked how that turned out. I think it added a lot to that door. Now it's time to add the ceiling. I think I've done enough in the project that I can cover up the roof of this box and it won't inhibit me too much. So I'm cutting the ceiling out of cardboard, making sure that I mark out where the rest of the hole is going to be that's going to reveal the Cheshire Cat smile. I also had to bend this piece of cardboard to match up with the warp that I had originally included in my design. Once I was happy with the shape and fit, I could go ahead and glue it in place. I didn't have to worry about finishing the underside because I knew I was going to do a pattern just like I had done for the floor. So I just basically made a pattern, cut it out of mat board. And I also made sure to pre-bend the mat board so it would match the bend that is in my ceiling. I added glue and then stuck it in place. I wanted this to look pretty much similar to the floor because I didn't want too many parts of the real world hallway to stand out. I wanted all focus to be on the Alice in Wonderland stuff. Now moving on to the Cheshire Cat Smile. I'm going to be using some black cardstock and some acetate. And I started by tracing the, well, I didn't trace it. I drew it out. I drew out the smile with a pencil and then I'm using an X-Acto blade to cut out each individual tooth so that I'm left with the smile shape cut out of the cardstock. I'm doing it kind of in the center of the paper because I know I'm going to have to judge where to place it once it's on top of my project. 
I then glued the acetate to the back of the cardstock because this is going to give it strength but still allow the light to pass through and light up the smile. Once it's dry, I can kind of put it through the hole and see how it's going to look. When the viewer looks into the book nook, I want to make sure that the first thing they see is that smile smiling back at them. I traced along the top edge so that I knew that it would sit on top of the shape and then I started to figure out how close or how far back the smile needed to be from the hole. Once I liked its positioning, I could tack it in place with my hot glue gun and then double check that everything looked right. Once I was happy with that, I could go ahead and build a box that completely enclosed the smile. I want it to be completely blacked out. I don't want there to be any light shining on the cardstock because that could reveal the secret and kind of break the magic that comes with the smile. The only thing I want the viewer to see is the light shining through the holes where the smile is. This means that once I constructed the box around it, I also needed to block out any light coming through the edges. So I took some more black cardstock and just glued it along the edges so it was as blacked out as it could possibly be, except for the few lights that I glued on the back. So here you can see the smile coming through, and once the lights are a little bit darker, it's really hard to see that cardstock paper. Now I can start to deal with the lights on the real world end of the hallway. I'm going to be gluing them straight to the ceiling because I want to make a fur down or a wall that kind of covers it up and creates the top of the ceiling. I also have one light that's hanging down that's going to become a real world light. I really like this lampshade I had from the past. I didn't really have anything to do with it. So my plan is to drill through it and put the light through so it looks like a lamp hanging down in the hallway. So now I'm going to be creating the tiny wall that goes and kind of hides these light wires. I also attached a mirror to the back of it so that when the lights are on, hopefully the mirror will kind of throw the light more into the book nook, which will help light it up a little bit. Before I add any finishes to this cardboard piece, I want to go ahead and figure out where my lamp is going to hang down. And then I'm going to use a blade or not a blade, a needle to punch through so that I make sure I have a place for the wire from the light to hang down and hold my lamp. I had some extra wallpaper and I figured this would be a great way to cover this up. It worked fairly well, except for when I bent it, I had strengthened the paper so much that it kind of made a weird crease. But in the end, I ended up covering this with some trim so it wasn't that big of a deal. I also added some paper hole punches and painted it silver for where the lamp is going to come through so it doesn't just look like it's hanging out of a hole in the ceiling. It kind of looks like it has some kind of base where the wire is coming out. Once I was happy with that, I could go ahead and add some dark wood trim and that's going to go around the outside edges of the hallway. This is going to cover up any of the cardboard edges and it's also going to cover up my folding mishap at the top where the wallpaper is. Now I'm going to be using my drill to drill through this plastic uh, cover for a lampshade. I was really nervous that it was going to break, but I just made sure to put my drill on low and go very slowly. I also added some glass paint to this one bulb. I want the bulb from the real world part of the hallway to be a warm light and this will contrast with the cold light or the white light that's coming from the Alice in Wonderland part of the hallway. So I thought that was just interesting to kind of dis dis distinctuate. No, that's not the word. Distinguish. That's the, that's the word I mean. Distinguish between the different lights that you see in the different parts of the hallway. I had this old pedestal part of an old desk that I ended up taking off and adding different legs to the desk, but I thought this would make a perfect half table to put in the hallway, and I want to add this little jug on top that will say, drink me. Originally, I thought it was going to be a piece of cake that said, eat me, but I found this in my collection. I thought, why not just go ahead and use the jar? So we sanded off half of the table and it was going to be ready to be put in the project later on. Now I know I have a bit of a habit of not finishing the outside of my projects. I did this with the abandoned room video I did a few, like a month ago, I think. And I didn't want to do that again. But here's the thing, I'm running out of time for this project and so I kind of have to choose between, you know, covering up the outside and making it look nice or make Alice. 
So I'm kind of guessing on your behalf that you'd much rather see me make an Alice figure for the room box rather than just kind of covering it with something. I do have an idea to finish it, but honestly it's just going to be like covered with books on either side, so I think I'm going to skip that part. I hope you agree with me. Let me know. Maybe we'll just have to do a video of me finishing the outside of my projects. To create Alice, I was so thankful that Elegoo reached out and wanted to send me a 3D printer. I wanted to create specifically Alice from Madness Returns, the video game, and I found a file online that I knew would be perfect. Now I do have a filament printer that I use pretty often, but there are noticeable lines that get printed into the print. I've had a resin printer in the past, but it was a pain in the rear and I could never suggest it to anyone when people wanted printer suggestions from me. It just, it, it messed up way too much. I've seen several people have success with Elegoo, so when they reached out and said, hey, can we send you a printer to try? I was like, yes, definitely. So this is not sponsored. They did send the printer to me for free, but I will be giving you my honest opinion. So to give you a tour of what I have here, the machine with the red lid is the printer that Elegoo sent to me. Next to it is a small bottle of resin. It's water washable resin that they sent for me to try. The thing with the yellow lid is the washing and curing station, which I bought for myself because I have seen Spellbound Miniatures use it and it looked super helpful. And so this is what I am using. This is my setup for resin printing, making sure to wear a glove and mask when dealing with any resin. So right now the print is on the printer itself. I'm adding water into the washable mixture and I'm just basically like moving the print plate over into the jug and then I can start the washing. And it works really well. It gets most of the resin off and anything that's left I can kind of brush off. When the cleaning is done I can remove it from the print plate and then everything goes into the curing station and I know this is supposed to be a review over the printer but uh, the printer worked really well. Um, yeah I, I'm really happy with how the printing came out but I really definitely wanted to try their curing station as well. So uh, it just kind of spins around and cures all the sides and you have to do this step after you print. I didn't end up having any printing mishaps except for ones that I did to myself. There were a couple pieces that were a little bit intersected in the print file so they printed a little weird. There was one area where it looked like maybe someone bumped the table while it was printing and the print shifted a little bit so if I wasn't rushed for time I would print it again but I did also accidentally print a larger Alice. So there's a little learning curve in learning the software, but as you can see, the print came out beautifully smooth. The printer did everything I asked it to. It was mostly operator error on my part. I also had to remove the dice from the original file and uh, because the resin was so hard, I could not cut through it. I could not cut the little boots off of the dice, so I had to figure out how to remove that in the file and reprint it. So now it's the process of putting Alice together. I, um, like you can see her kneecap, that's where I kind of messed up on the file, but I'm going to try and fill that in. The resin sanded really, really well, and I was happy with the finish it had. The file comes with pegs to put the figure together, but because I was printing this so small, I don't think this is the size it's supposed to be printed at, but um, because I printed it small, the pegs really didn't function super well. And so I'm just going to be creating my own pegs by using a drill and a toothpick. Once the pegs were in place, I just used a combination of tacky glue and super glue. Those almost dry instantly when they come in contact with each other. And of course you have to at least drop a few pieces in the process, <laughs> but eventually the whole thing came together and was a very solid piece. So I do suggest if you try printing this file, um, yeah, just kind of make your own pegs. That seemed to work for me. 
Before I could paint her, I really did have to fix the gap in her knee, and I should have used Milliput for this, but after reading the directions and seeing that it takes three to four hours to dry, I really didn't have time to wait for that, so I decided to try Joint Compound. And if her knee falls off in the future, I know I will just have to go back and take my punishment for skipping the correct step, but it actually ended up seeming like it worked and I just used a little bit of water on a sculpting tool to smooth everything down. I'm using the Army Painter paints that came in the Jazza Mega Minis box that I got a while ago. They are really pigmented paints and I knew it would make a quick job of covering this really dark gray resin. And I worked pretty hard to try and find an acceptable Alice color for her dress. The following clips are going to kind of speed through the painting process, and if you want me to do a more detailed painting process on another figure later on, I'm more than happy to. But I wanted to let you know that if you are interested in looking into a 3D printer, I've really only used this one a couple times, but it has worked amazing both times. Elegoo has left a coupon code for you. It's Bentley HM, but it's only for September 27th through October 3rd of this year. So you'll have to wait a couple days from when this video comes out, but if you are interested and you are thinking about looking into Elegoo anyway, wait for those dates. You can use that coupon code and get a discount. I do plan to use the printer more, so if you're not convinced or you're not sure I've done it enough to give you a real review, you're more than welcome to wait and I can always reach out and see if Elegoo can send us another coupon in the future. I don't know. I don't know if they do that, but I can always ask. So here is how my final Alice figure looks. If you're wondering why she's holding a hobby horse, that's a reference back to Alice Madness Returns. My favorite weapon in that game is actually the Pepper Grinder, but my second favorite is the hobby horse. She's supposed to be holding the Vorpal Blade in her hand, but I forgot to print that, so I will be printing that in the future. So now that Alice is in place, I feel comfortable enough to put in the table. I really wanted to know where she would be standing and how she looked in the space before putting this piece in. I also added a little aged drink me label to the outside of the jug and that is going to be glued on the table so that it's easy for her to grab when she's ready to go to battle in Wonderland. So now all that's left to do is turn on the lights and take a final look at our Alice in Wonderland book nook. I'm really, really loving how this turned out, and I don't know why it took me so long to create a book nook for my own shelves in my studio. And of course, it's not truly a book nook until it's between some books. So that's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you to Elegoo for sending me the printer to try out with the Alice print. And big thank you to Miss Mini Life for collabing with me today. This was such a fun project. It gave me the excuse to jump into my Alice obsession. And I can't wait to see what she created. Make sure you check it out too in the description box below. Click her link, it'll take you to her video. Also put a link to her channel and look around because her post-apocalyptic fairy tale series is just one of my favorites right now, and I'm positive that if you like my channel, you will enjoy them too. I hope you all have an amazing week, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I will see you in the next one. What was that? Quick housekeeping announcement for the end of this video. I know it's not a blooper, but I just have to let y'all know. Next week is when I'm taking the Adams Family House to Tucson, Arizona, to the museum. So there will not be a video, but I will be filming my process. So when I get back, I hope to make an entire Adams Family Museum video for y'all to enjoy. So there won't be a video next week, but there will be filming going on. And I'll try to update a little bit on 
Instagram when I can. Thank you all for your support through the process of just this whole thing. I really appreciate it and I will see y'all soon. Bye.